Even before Bohr, the American Gilbert Lewis had suggested that electrons are arranged in shells. Experiments show that electron density is a maximum at certain distances from the nucleus. If we look at this graph with electron density on the vertical axis and distance from the nucleus on the horizontal axis, if we look at data for helium, what we'll find is that very, very close to the nucleus, there is very little probability of finding an electron. Very far from the nucleus, there's a very low probability of finding an electron. But some distance right about there, that's most likely where we're going to find an electron. If we do the same sort of graph for neon, neon, we note, has two maxima. Helium only has one. This corresponds to the fact that helium only has a single energy level, whereas neon has a first energy level indicated by this first peak here, and then it has a second energy level associated with the second peak. Notice that the first peak for neon is only this far from the nucleus, whereas the first peak for helium is this far from the nucleus. What that means is that the 1s orbital in neon is smaller. It's tinier. It's closer to the nucleus than the 1s orbital in helium. And if we put argon in there, argon is element 18. It has three energy levels, which correspond to the three peaks in this graph. And here again, you'll notice that the 1s orbital, right, that is the first energy level, that's all we have in the first energy level, for argon is even closer to the nucleus than for neon and for helium. These graphs also show that there is no clearly defined boundary between one shell and another. In other words, the shells are diffuse, they're fuzzy, they kind of fade one into the other. They're not clearly defined like planets going around a sun. In this slide, I'm attempting to show what happens to the different energy levels as you go down a group. If we think of this top atom as being helium. Helium has a 1s orbital, and that's it. 1s2 is what helium has. Neon has 1s2, and then it has 2s2, 2p6. So it has a second energy level. And this is what was shown on the previous slide. You note here that for neon, the 1s orbital is tinier. It's pulled more tightly to the nucleus because neon has more protons. And as you go down any column, you notice what happens to the size of that 1s orbital. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Same with the second energy level, which I've indicated by a green circle. In the case of neon, it is a certain size. But with argon, we have a second energy level, and it's tinier. With krypton, which is below argon, we have an even tinier second energy level, and so on. However, the overall size of the atom, of course, increases because we're constantly adding new energy levels on the outside, like layers of an onion. Approximate bonding atomic radii for the elements have been tabulated. So if we have two atoms here, if we go from the nucleus to the outer edge of where the electrons are, of course that edge is a little bit fuzzy, it's a little bit debatable, we call that the atomic radius. If we bond these two atoms together, the bonding atomic radius goes from the nucleus of the atom in question to the center of that bond. In general, atomic radii are larger than bonding atomic radii. You can see that in the picture here at the top of the screen. The distance between bonded nuclei can be approximated by adding the bonding radii from both atoms. So for example, if the bonding atomic radii for carbon and bromine are given there, whenever you have a carbon-bromine bond, the distance between those nuclei is approximately the sum of those, which is 1.91 angstroms.
As mentioned on the previous slide, the bond length is the center to center distance between two bonded atoms. It's the distance between their nuclei. The bond length is fairly constant for a particular bond. For example, a carbon-hydrogen bond, no matter what compound we're talking about. In methane, which is CH4, we have carbon-hydrogen bonds, and in propane, we have carbon-hydrogen bonds, and the carbon-hydrogen bonds in one compound are basically the same length as the carbon-hydrogen bonds in any other compound. And these bond lengths have been tabulated. You can look them up. It's a lot easier than trying to experimentally determine them on your own. Other people have done that. As the number of covalent bonds between two atoms increases, the bond length is going to decrease and the bond enthalpy, that is the energy that it takes to break the bond, goes up. You can think of taking two magnets that will tend to repel each other, and if I put one rubber band around them, they will pull together a little bit. If I put then a second rubber band around them, then they'll pull together a little tighter, and a third rubber band, they'll pull together even tighter even though they're trying to repel each other. To illustrate this, I've put the bond length between a carbon-carbon single bond and its bond enthalpy, that is the energy required to break it, and then I've done that for a carbon-carbon double bond and a carbon-carbon triple bond. And you can see that as the number of covalent bonds between atoms increases, the bond length goes down and the bond enthalpy goes up.